Good evening, I'm Peter Mansbridge, and this is The National. Toronto's runaway housing market poses a national threat. Can the measures discussed today defuse a ticking bomb? This situation won't be fixed overnight. Donald Trump's new hardline on NAFTA. Fix it or kill it. Because in Canada, some very unfair things have happened to our dairy farmers. They fought to protect Fort McMurray. Now many report poor health. Plus, Moncton makes a pitch to U.S. workers who suddenly don't feel at home. I think Canada is uh, more open. Donald Trump was talking tough on NAFTA today, and this time Canada was his target. The U.S. president called out this country's milk producers. Good politics in Wisconsin, dairy country USA, but was it just politics? The CBC's Paul Hunter has the story. From Donald Trump today in Wisconsin, the heartland of the American dairy industry, a direct shot at their counterparts to the north. In Canada, some very unfair things have happened to our dairy farmers. What's happened to you is very, very unfair. It's another typical one-sided deal against the United States, and it's not going to be happening for long. Trump's comments are on a specific issue, but with broad implications, about what's called ultra-filtered milk, a niche product Canada had been buying from the U.S. until recent changes in Canada made that more difficult, costing some in the U.S. industry who now worry they may have to close their farms. If we don't have a place for our milk, there's no... We can't continue. Americans have long argued Canada's dairy industry is overprotected and have wanted a way into it. We're going to get together and we're going to call Canada and we're going to say, what happened? Trump didn't mention that a key challenge for U.S. dairy farmers is that they've long had more milk than they can sell. As one Trump opponent in Wisconsin tweeted, as a Wisconsin dairy farmer, I want to look at overproduction here, not just scapegoat Canada underlined tonight in a letter to the governors of New York and Wisconsin from Canada's ambassador to the U.S. Canada does not accept that its dairy policies are the cause of financial loss for dairy farmers in the United States, wrote David McNaughton, adding, Canada is not a contributor to the overproduction problem. But some in Canada's dairy industry worry as Trump threatens to tear up the North American Free Trade Agreement might the dairy industry become a bargaining chip? He's in a very high position, so yes, we take it very seriously when someone slaps our system the way he has. Are Trump's comments today an opening salvo or just rhetoric? Others in Canada's industry are betting it's the latter. Trump being Trump. Uh, he's in a dairy state, and uh, the dairy industry in the U.S. is... Uh, having challenged times. I, I feel sorry for their producers there. But the underlying suggestion from Donald Trump, who'd earlier hinted that when it comes to NAFTA and Canada, he was looking simply for tweaks, may well be instead he seeks a whole rewrite. Paul Hunter, CBC News, Washington. Well, Ottawa doesn't often get involved when it comes to home prices. So when the finance minister sits down with his Ontario counterpart and the mayor of Toronto, it's a sign there is real worry about the soaring prices and the possibility it could all come to a crashing end. So why should you care if you're in Winnipeg or Halifax or Regina? Nearly one-fifth of Canadians live in the greater Toronto area. The GTA represents a huge chunk of the economy, the equivalent of all of Alberta or Atlantic Canada plus Manitoba and Saskatchewan. To borrow from another saying, if Toronto sneezes, Canada catches a cold. Here's what has people worried. Toronto's average home is now more than $900,000. That's detached, semi-detached, condo, townhouse. And it's an increase of more than a third from a year ago. Where else was there that kind of a jump? Not just an hour outside Toronto, but even further afield too. Prices pushing people out of Toronto, who are, in turn, pushing prices up outside the city, too. Ron Charles begins our coverage. 
even with a budget hovering around $700,000, Alyssa Juhas and her husband found they didn't have nearly enough for a decent home to raise their two children in Toronto. We were um, approved for a mortgage, but we were looking at places that were feeling like dives still, and we couldn't believe we would be spending that much money on a place that we wouldn't even love. Last month's average price for the now rare and elusive Toronto single-family detached home was nearly $1.6 million. That's enough for eight detached homes in Moncton, or almost five of them in Winnipeg. The rising home prices brought about today's meeting between the city's mayor and the Ontario and federal finance ministers. There is widespread speculation that governments might try to cool the market with a tax on foreign buyers similar to Vancouver's. But that's not what they announced. The federal finance minister did say people investing in housing other than their principal residence should expect extra tax scrutiny. We will ensure that the Canada Revenue Agency dedicates resources to ensuring compliance of the real estate sector in the GTA with tax laws and will work with the province of Ontario to obtain enhanced land registry data to help support tax compliance activities in the GTA. The only tax Toronto's mayor talked of is not aimed specifically at just foreign investors. We're looking at a vacant home tax and whether that could ensure real estate in Toronto is first and foremost, as it should be, a place to live uh, and as an investment, second. Data. Ontario's finance minister, who introduces a budget next week, is the one who would have to approve a foreign buyer's tax. So in the coming week, the Ontario government will announce a suite of measures designed to increase supply and address demand. A major problem faced by the three levels of government is a lack of information about what's driving Toronto housing prices higher. Ottawa has put Statistics Canada on the case to try to determine how much of it is due to house flipping, foreign investing, or just people trying to find a place to live. Ron Charles, CBC News, Toronto. Vancouver may be looking east and thinking, been there, dealt with that. The market in Vancouver has cooled down somewhat. Jacqueline Hansen looks at the measures introduced there and whether they would work in Toronto. In Vancouver, it was billed as a game changer. A foreign buyer's tax to ward off some outside demand. Eight months in, and the market has cooled slightly. I'd say that it psychologically um, acted to break things down and slow things down, and I think it gave reassurance to people. But there are signs things are already heating back up. You have these other factors, low interest rates, lots of capital, millennials entering their buying years that were also driving the market. Policymakers in Toronto are watching and trying to learn. Stability in both markets is crucial to the entire country, but it's unclear how big the issue of foreign buyers is in either city. Well, I think the jury is still out on the foreign buyers tax in Vancouver, unfortunately. So. I'm not sure it's a super good basis to, to plan policy on. Scotiabank's chief economist says Toronto needs a tax that targets house flippers instead. What we propose to do is a special tax on sellers of properties, but that tax will only kick in when folks uh, hold their place for a short period of time. Wow. Still, tax tweaks that focus on demand for homes leave out a major issue, supply, and a lack of it. It's a great space. Politicians need to look at the extent to which their own policies um, particularly around zoning and development, are affecting the, pro the city's housing affordability challenges. Higher density projects and building on protected green spaces are some suggestions to create supply in increasingly competitive real estate markets. We felt fabulous, yeah. Every morning we wake up and go, 875. Marnie Bluen is cashing out before any policy changes can affect her. Her home sold in just hours for $200,000 over asking, but it comes at a cost. Uh, it makes me very sad for my son. Like I just, my son's 30, he's about to get married. I could own, he at one point wanted to buy this house. But there's no way. In a market where what's good for some isn't good for others, the challenge for policymakers is even greater. And finding a balance without triggering any unintended consequences will no doubt be complicated. Jacqueline Hansen, CBC News, Toronto. Coming up, the fate of a killer who posted his crime on Facebook. Our kids, you know, they need to take this as a lesson. Plus, Moncton calls out to U.S. workers unnerved by Donald Trump.
We want to have that cultural diversity. We are looking to uh, get a whole lot more of it. They saved a city, worked around the clock fighting flames. But nearly one year after fire destroyed parts of Fort McMurray, many of, front, many of the frontline workers are suffering. Briar Stewart looks at the new research revealing the physical and psychological toll on firefighters. More than 3,000 firefighters from across Alberta descended on the Fort McMurray area last May to fight a fire like they had never seen. The firefighters were in a situation where they were trying to deal with house after house after building after building for hours and hours on end. Uh, and that, of course, is not something that we are typically prepared for. More than 100 firefighters from Strathcona County were on the ground in Fort McMurray. They were among the first to be tested by Nicola Cherry, an epidemiologist with the University of Alberta. In the immediate aftermath of the fire, she measured lung function and took blood and urine samples. In all, she tested and surveyed 355 Alberta firefighters and found that 20% of them reported persistent respiratory problems. 16% had lingering mental health issues. People who were right in the thick of it, who were in the fire in the first few days and who were very heavily exposed, have, are more likely to have both problems with their breathing and, and mental health. For the local responders, there was the added stress of watching their own neighborhoods burn. They've lost their homes, their community. Uh, some spouses don't want to move back. Uh, and I, I mean, it's, they, they saw things that uh, no one else saw. Over the next few years, researchers want to follow up with all the firefighters who worked the Fort McMurray fire. Their health will be compared with other factors like the length of shifts they were working and the kind of breathing protection they were wearing to see under what scenarios firefighters fared better. Bushell is encouraging his department to participate in the ongoing study. And that's what we hope to get out of it, is some tools that we can use in the future to be able to say this is how best to manage those dangerous, difficult, disaster situations. Because even though Fort McMurray wasn't a typical fire, he says crews could be called upon again to respond to a similar disaster. Briar Stewart, CBC News, Edmonton. The trial began today for two British Columbia men charged with polygamy. Winston Blackmore and James Oler entered pleas of not guilty. Both men have served as bishops of a fundamentalist religious sect in Bountiful, B.C. The trial is expected to last several weeks. A suspicious package on Parliament Hill caused a security scare this morning after a man threw a bag under the peace tower. Turns out it contained jeans and a bag labeled computer wires. He was arrested and could face charges. British politics continue to surprise. Less than a year after a majority said yes to Brexit, voters will soon head back to the polls. Prime Minister Theresa May, who campaigned against leaving the EU, called a snap election today, three years before she had to. Thomas Dagla explains why. No one saw this news coming. A spring election with Brexit as a backdrop. Not another one? Oh, for God's sake, I can't honestly, I can't stand this. Believe it. It's a change of tune for the Prime Minister who swore... I'm not going to be calling a snap election. But now says... So we need a general election and we need one now. The Tories swept to power just two years ago. Then came Britain's choice to leave the European Union. David Cameron quit and May stepped in. Now, as Brexit negotiations begin, she wants the mandate of an elected leader. That the only way to guarantee certainty and stability for the years ahead is to hold this election. Britain knows where this road leads, and that's outside the EU. But what route the country will take and who will be in the driver's seat could be the main theme of this campaign. The opposition Labour Party welcomed the election call, while the Liberal Democrats were the first to stage what looked like a campaign rally, pledging they'd put the brakes on Brexit. Well, it's an opportunity for uh, the people of this country to change the direction of this country, to decide that they do not want a hard Brexit. Cancelling the breakup altogether would be nearly impossible now. 
Theresa May style. Of, Seeing this uh, strictly as a Brexit election, though, could be a risky strategy, says this politics watcher. But it's always a bad idea to, th to take the things that obsess the political classes and think that's why people vote. People vote for all kinds of reasons. A lot of them will be local. In fact, Scots will likely vote considering their own future in or out of the UK. The Prime Minister's announcement today is one all about the narrow interests of our own party, not the interests of the country. May's Conservative Party has a majority in Parliament and feels it could gain more seats. First, though, she'll need the support of two-thirds of MPs to hold an election three years ahead of schedule. Thomas Dagg, CBC News, London. French security officials say they've stopped what they call an imminent and violent attack just five days before the first round of the country's presidential election. Police arrested two French nationals in Marseille, seizing weapons and bomb-making material. Reports suggest the men's target was the Conservative Party leader. All four presidential candidates had been warned about the threat. Straight ahead, the killer who defiled social media. His manhunt came to a dramatic end. A new life for more than 250 people. The Arusa Sun carries refugees from Hungary, those who fought against a tyrannical government and then fled when their cause was crushed by Russian tanks. More than 3,000 people jammed the dockyard to shout their welcome. And they marched down the liner's gangplank onto Canadian soil, accompanied by the music of the Royal 22nd Regiment's band. Canada is one of the few countries accepting Vietnamese refugees. Under our present quota, by the end of the year, we will have taken 2,000 from Hong Kong. For the past six months, it's been up to a dedicated 22-year-old Montrealer, Scott Mullen, to decide who gets in and who doesn't. OK, we will accept his application to go to Canada. How do you know they can adapt to Canada? Well, if somebody can sail across the South China Sea and spend two months on sea, a few months here in a camp situation like this, I think they'll be able to adapt reasonably well. Noontime, and the would-be refugees are allowed outside for an hour. When the hour is up, they go back, single file, into the stuffy gymnasium that is their home. The Canadian government hasn't had to publicly explain why it's detaining these people for so long, except to say that it doesn't yet know for sure who they really are or whether they'll show up for their immigration hearings. All of the other illegal immigrants that have come here, they haven't been treated that way. The uh, turbans and beards are a great influence. Members of the local Sikh community are upset with the way the government and the way the Canadian public has reacted to this latest boatload of people. This is the image that stands out most in people's minds. I think they should ship them all back where they come from. Canada will give political asylum to 26,000 Yugoslavian refugees. While it's welcome news, refugee advocates say the Canadian government is playing a dangerous double standard. They say refugees from Somalia should get the same treatment as those from Yugoslavia. As we know, the civil war and also the famine has displaced millions of people. We want justice! Yesterday, Somalis protested outside of immigration offices calling for fair treatment. Most Somalis more than Sarajevo. So if they don't give it down to Somalia... Give him our peace. Different language, different culture, different lives. You can see the strain on so many faces. Crammed into a gymnasium, the refugees listen to the Prime Minister explain he hopes they can one day return to their homeland if they choose. And I'm sure that you can feel at home among us. A point-blank shooting posted on Facebook. A massive manhunt that spanned five U.S. states before going nationwide. And then, suddenly it was all over. The suspect in the online murder that shocked the world is dead, but the controversy remains over how Facebook handles videos showing acts of brutality. Stephen D'Souza has the latest on the fallout. The manhunt for the so-called Facebook killer ended in Erie, Pennsylvania. Steve Stevens had pulled into this drive through when a worker recognized him, and quick-thinking staff tried to stall him. Basically just told him it was going to be a minute for his fries which it wasn't really. We were just trying to make sure she got in contact with the state police. Stevens was suspicious and took off. Police chased him for nearly three kilometers. They tried to stop the car by nudging it from behind. But as it spun out of control, police say Stevens pulled out a gun and shot himself in the head. 
This started with one tragedy and ended, you know, with another person taking their own life. Our kids, although they should not have seen this, I'm sure a lot have, uh, you know, they need to take this as a lesson. We can't do this in this country. We just can't do it. I snapped. I snapped. Dog, I just snapped, dog. Stephen's death leaves police searching for the reason why he shot 74-year-old Robert Godwin and then posted the video to Facebook. Stevens was reportedly upset over gambling issues and a breakup. His suicide also leaves unanswered questions for Godwin's family. He killed himself. You took the car away out, but you left my kids without a father. The viral nature of the video, up for three hours before Facebook took it down, has raised questions about the responsibility of social media companies. We have a lot of work and we will keep doing all we can to prevent tragedies like this from happening. Facebook says it acted quickly to remove the videos, but admits it can do better. It says it's working on faster ways for both the company and the public to report dangerous content. Stephen D'Souza, CBC News, New York. Turks opposed to their president sweeping new powers hit the streets in protest again today. Allegations of vote rigging from Sunday's referendum just won't go away. Opponents want the result thrown out. The Europeans want an investigation. But as Neil Coxell reports, as far as President Trump is concerned, it's all thumbs up. They voted no, and they refused to take anything but no for an answer. So we want our rights back. We want our votes back. We want our country back. Beyond pockets like this one in Istanbul, people around the world are watching what happens here very closely wondering, worrying even, about what Turkey's government might do next. We call on the Turkish authorities to consider the next steps very carefully. European leaders are worried about Sunday's still disputed referendum results and the expanded powers President Recep Tayyip Erdogan now expects to get. The European Union's on-again, off-again relationship with Turkey is in trouble, and Turkey could make a so-called Trexit even before it actually joins the group. Though physically in Europe, under Erdogan, the country's ideology has been drifting further and further east. George Neder, Hans Neder, Helga Neder. What George, Hans or Helga say, that's not our problem, Erdogan said, mocking European election monitors, questioning the results. There are billions of dollars of business at stake between Europe and Turkey. Three million refugees Europe wants Turkey to keep. The region's biggest battles, Syria, ISIS, are likely why U.S. President Donald Trump dialed Erdogan's number last night, the first major world leader to offer congratulations after Sunday's vote. Critics say Trump is legitimizing what could be an illegitimate vote, and a leader careening towards dictatorship. Neat Cooks, all CBC News, Istanbul. Two different kinds of royalty are teaming up to fight mental health stigmas. Prince William and Lady Gaga put out this video today. It's okay to have this conversation. It's really important to have this conversation and that you, 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 know, you won't be judged. It's so important to, to break open that fear and that taboo, which is it's only going to lead to more problems down the line. Yes, it can make a, a huge difference. I feel like we are not hiding anymore. We're starting to talk. And that's what we need to do, really. Absolutely. It's to be great if we William was impressed with Lady Gaga's open letter that revealed how a sexual assault left her with PTSD. So he asked her to join his Heads Together campaign about mental illness. You can see the whole video on Will and Kate's Facebook page. And Canada will welcome another generation of royals for the country's birthday. Prince Charles and Camilla arrive June 29th for three days. They'll visit Nunavut, the capital region, and other sites in Ontario. Governor General David Johnston will host the pair for the big 150th anniversary celebrations in Ottawa on July 1st. Up next, Canada has a lot of appeal right now for some U.S. workers. I know I have to think, is it really my home? Am I really welcome here? As they think twice about America, the city of Moncton is rolling out the welcome map. And he's had it with all the talk of helping the middle class.
The game is space war and is played on a computer. At the moment, it provides esoteric sport for young mathematicians at MIT. Someday, it may train them to fight a war in space. Whether it's the nice zingy sound they make, the electronic challenge, or just the thrill of controlling what happens on a television screen, TV games are exerting a powerful fascination. What do you think of the game you're playing? I love it. These students at the University of Alberta in Edmonton have developed a series of games that can be played on the computer. The idea of the game is to manipulate the cursor towards your enemy until you get him in the center. And once you've got him there, bang and he's dead. Defender, Asteroids, Missile Command, the names of some of the arcade hits that are attracting millions of video addicts every day. Video junkies have a current favorite. Someone even wrote a song about Pac-Man. Pac-Man grossed more money in arcades last year than the movie Star Wars, one of the most successful Hollywood films. These are not games you would find in an arcade. They are the latest generation of home video. And this is where the real boom in the industry is occurring. I don't play that much. They're really addicted to this thing. This is a story about a game. A game some say is so exciting, so enthralling, so much fun, that if you ever start playing, you won't be able to stop. Your fingers flying over buttons as you jump, fly, crush, and kill your way through an alternate reality. Alluring, fascinating, compelling. A curse. They're video games, the flashy, trashy offshoots of the computer revolution. Its programmers say we haven't seen anything yet. The first, the best known, the sex change operation was one performed about 15 years ago on a young ex-GI named George Jorgensen who went to Copenhagen and came back as Christine. When Christine's story was told around the world, there were applications from hundreds of young men who wanted to undergo the same kind of operation. Well, Diana, now that you're officially a woman, how does it feel? I feel absolutely marvelous, thank you. Did you always want to be a woman? As long as I can remember, sir, yes. And now that you are, uh, how does it, what do you miss most about being a man? I never was really in, in intensity a man. Um, or psychologically, so I miss nothing about my malehood. Lee Davis of Ottawa was born a woman. Recently, after a number of medical operations, Lee Davies became a man. I was only a kid. I felt different. I mean, I knew I wasn't, my body wasn't what my mind was saying I was. My mind was totally male. Caroline's surgery 17 years ago gave her the woman's body she dreamt of and a model's salary of $200,000 a year. No one questioned her femininity. In fact, she modeled for seven years before the British tabloids made her story public. She even played a Bond girl in a 007 film. It's only the British government that doesn't accept the change. I'm sort of classified still as a man. I mean, I break the law every day if I use the woman's toilet. I mean, I can't really use the the men's. I mean, if I committed a crime, I'd be in a men's prison. Well, over the past 150 years, Canadians have enjoyed a good deal of prosperity and opportunity. But keeping up that overall trend is not a sure thing. In the shifting sands of the global economy, it takes ingenuity to seize the moment. Tonight, a case study. The city of Moncton, New Brunswick, is brimming with opportunity. So much so that it made a play for workers south of the border, where many no longer feel at home. Joanna Remiliotis met some of the people who heard Moncton calling. Manchester, Connecticut. 
a small, sleepy town a couple of hours north of Manhattan. If you're going to move for a job in the city, you would think the Big Apple is the place to go. Think again. So how much do you know about London? Um, it's, I would say not too much. Whoa, this looks like fun, doesn't it? Not much is a start, considering a few months ago, Nicola Graham hadn't even heard of the place. But that was before the scrappy little Canadian city came calling. And now this engineering specialist and her family may be the next ones to come from away. It seems to be up and coming. Like there's a lot of hiring and it's growing, which is always good. You know, it's a nice small town, there's a beach. I mean, you know, how much better can it get? <laughs> Moncton, New Brunswick is where it's at? Yep, there are nearly a thousand openings in the city today and at least a thousand more jobs coming soon, many of them in high-skilled trades like IT. But there aren't enough qualified people here to fill them, not enough qualified people in Canada willing to move here. So Moncton, a city poised to boom, devised a plan to not go bust. Now we see an opportunity with the uh, United States with the new president and... Uh, Donald Arsenault is the Minister of Immigration in the only province in Canada with a declining population. He really needs people to move here. So when he saw a Trump card, he didn't think twice about playing it. There are people looking elsewhere. They're maybe uncertain about their future in their own country. Maybe they want to look elsewhere. And we feel that Canada, um, you know, with, with the strong values and principles that we do have, uh, is so, so important and it's who we are. And uh, I think that uh, opens a lot of eyes. Moncton has peddled its maritime charm and low cost of living to prospective employees before. But in a savvy move, it figured the time was politically right to make that pitch south of the border. So one day after the U.S. election, a day after Donald Trump won, New Brunswick launched a bold campaign and announced it would be holding a job fair in the U.S. The phone started ringing off the hook. Hmm. I'm leaning towards this one. But Graham was one of the first to call and bought a new interview outfit. She and her husband Mark don't need jobs. They both have good ones here in IT. But a sense of foreboding set in last fall, and she can't shake it. It's not about what's going to happen tomorrow or what's going to happen next week. I'm more worried about what's going to happen in the future, and I'm trying to act on it before it happens. Want to drive your train, buddy? Graham has always worried about gun violence. It's made her question raising her son here. But the tipping point came when Trump got elected and race-related incidents started to rise. I've been living here for a while and I've just gotten used to this being my home. And now I have to think, is it really my home? Am I really welcome here? What's going to happen in the future? You know, am I going to actually eventually run into somebody that tells me I need to go back to where I'm from? I mean, I don't know. Now, based on some of the leadership and some of the comments, it comes across as it's okay now to be, as Nicola mentioned, more emboldened. So these fringe groups are no longer being on the fringe, and they're also gathering up quite a good following. Last bag. The opportunity to leave those fears behind became more real a few weeks ago, when word finally came that after months of delays, Moncton was holding that American job fair in New York City. The Grahams packed up and hit the road to find out more. Hi. My name is New Brunswick. And New Brunswick was ready and waiting. Sure, it may all seem a little hokey, but a laid-back lifestyle is part of what seems to be a winning package. Hundreds of people turned up at the job fair. So many, Carrie Alberts didn't have time to take a break. And this was after all the calls she had taken. Most of the calls that I was getting in the very, right off the very start was, we need to come now. Why are you not coming until February? You know, you're looking for me now. It's, it's November, it's December. You know, so I think a lot of that right off the, out of the gate was great. The sense of urgency was huge. Alberts works for 3 Plus, an economic development company that is helping the province recruit workers. It was a provocative move to pounce on the political anxiety here, but it got the job done. 
it did what we wanted it to do. We wanted to get the message out that we have companies that are in Moncton that are looking to hire skilled employees. And that's, that's what we got. So it was great. A lot of what you were explaining already, I didn't Moncton that. figured it would tap into something. And it did. A growing sense of unease among minorities in the U.S. The messaging was not accidental. It was aimed at people like Graham. It sounds promising. It's probably going to be competitive because it's job-based, and of course, there's usually more applicants in their jobs. Um, but you know, I'm I'm confident I stand out in some way. And like Graham, many of the people who turned up have multiple degrees and already have good jobs. But like Hong Sun, aren't American citizens yet, and suddenly aren't sure they ever will be. The uncertainty makes me uh, nervous. At this time, um, I, I think Canada is uh, more open to um, accepting foreign workers and, and new immigrants. It definitely works to our advantage. We are, uh, we are Canadians, we are Maritimers, and we certainly will welcome them all with open arms. We have never gotten this many resumes. Shelley Butler helps they run Dovico, a, a software a company in Moncton. She sent a representative to the job fair um, in New York and was stunned sense. by what she I got mean, back. I kind of let it a little holler and I said, girls, come and check out what we got. <laughs> With free yoga and chef-made meals, Dovico already prides itself on making its employees happy. But like any other IT company in this city, it has room to grow. It just never expected more than 200 resumes. To get 215 from people who didn't know us, um, yeah, I was overwhelmed. Truly, I was overwhelmed, yeah. It was, really wasn't any expectation. Uh, it is striking, was, Butler says, like that nearly every applicant and is a visible minority and is highly skilled. A brain drain that is Moncton's gain and not just an economic one. We want to have that cultural diversity. We want to see that. Um, we have very little of it here in the greater Moncton area and we are looking to uh, get a whole lot more of it. So if Dovico can be a part, of, of having those minority groups come in and we can show them a, you know, what a great asset they can be here and how happy um, they can be in our community is, is important. The soft sell, friendly town, access to the coast has another ace too. A new government program that will offer permanent residency status to any new hire, cutting months of red tape. If you haven't figured it out already, Moncton is playing to win. You can't just sit in your, your backyard and wait for everybody to come to you. Uh, we have to go out there and, and present that message and that's what we've done in New York. And this is a critical time to survive or thrive. MLT, another software company, is looking to double its 40-person workforce as soon as possible. So I think it's a, new, a good thing that uh, we can offer this. Uh, Jeff is already into it. Charles Gervais runs the place. Along with competitive salaries, fast-tracking residency status is a huge selling point, he says, especially to people feeling less welcome south of the border. In our books, they're all humans. They all have a need. We have a need. So it's to uh, bridge this gap to make uh, our business uh, sustainable. It's fair game, basically. Yes, exactly. In fact, five people here were hired on the spot. It may seem impulsive to just pick up and go to a humble city that has trouble getting Canadians to move there. But for Graham, waiting it out feels risky too. It's more than just a president. It's more than just an administration. So there are, and then the culture, I mean, if the culture is so that people become anti-immigrants, it doesn't matter who leaves, uh, you know, if he leaves in four years, that's still going to be there. So it's, it's, more, it's more than just what's happening in the current administration. It's bigger than that, at least for me. Graham hasn't had any offers yet. Moncton is still taking resumes. And if its plucky pitch pays off, the small maritime city may just prove to be the land of opportunity no one had heard of before. Joanna Brumaliotis, CBC News, Moncton. Well, now to one of the most remote places in Canada. Tuktoyoktuk is pressed up against the Arctic Ocean. For much of the year, it's cut off from the rest of the country. The ice road that connects it to the south only open in winter. But that's about to change. 
A new all-season highway is nearly complete, running from Tuktoyoktuk down to Inuvik and continuing south to Edmonton and Vancouver. They call it the road to the top of the world. But it also means the end of an ice age. In the days before the winter road closes for good, David Common takes us there. The only road in and out of Tuck, as they call this community, is a nearly 200 kilometer frozen journey along the ocean. For dozens of winters, it has ended isolation, brought fresh groceries and outsiders. But within days, the sea ice and the frozen Mackenzie River will thaw and the road will close forever. Well, every year when the ice was gone, everybody just like, it's, it's so lonely, you're isolated, you're, you're stuck again. Merv Grubin's ancestry in Tuktoyaktuk goes back more generations than anyone can remember. But the history of his community and the country is about to change. This is the beginning of a new road, one to be open year round. Crisscrossing the open tundra. It's great for the 150th anniversary of Canada, I think. Indeed, after four years of construction, often running 24 hours a day in frigid weather, frequent storms over what was unexplored terrain, the first road to the Arctic Ocean is now very nearly complete. Just this one bridge remains. When it's finished, Canada will be connected from sea to sea to sea. And for the first time, we're driving the whole way from Inuvik to Tuck with Merv Grubin. You see all the equipment, the people working, and it, it's hard to comprehend that all the work that you did, all the meetings and lobbying, was all, was all for something. It wasn't for nothing. Grubin was the mayor of Tuktoyaktuk when the Harper government agreed to build the $300 million highway. Then we're going to go into 177. Now, Merv co-owns one of the main contractors hauling gravel to finish the road. They're on budget and on time. You see, we're building this road that's connecting Canada from coast to coast to coast. So I don't know much other places in the, in the world that have the connected Arctic Ocean to the Pacific and, and the Atlantic Ocean. Great bragging rights for Canada, but at the cost of big change in Little Tuktoyaktuk. Just 800 people who now lead a mostly quiet life, largely centered around the land. Whatever comes to the good, also the bad come, meaning more booze might come in, more drugs. These are a pair of polar bear mitts. Eileen Jacobson has her worries, but she makes a living touring visitors around her Arctic community too. And that's what we use for when we're traveling out in the dead of winter. Yeah. Since I was born and raised here, that's what I uh, tell them. A little bit of history about uh, our town. And I also do three hour tours, which is a culture tour. Do a two hour tour of the town, then I bring it to my home. Then I feed them our native food. So we always use- Eileen may be busier than ever soon enough. The Northwest Territories predicts a surge in summer travelers from the South to the Arctic Ocean, an adventure into a foreign land without leaving Canada. <coughs> and there are other local benefits Eileen's looking ahead to as well. Well, the all-weather road, hopefully it'll bring the prices of the heating well down, the groceries, and then we're not isolated uh, for anybody. Anybody with a vehicle can go on the all-weather road and go, go on a holiday, bring their family out, especially in the summertime when school is out, and then hopefully bring more people in so we could tell about our community. We're, we're look target date of November. 15. It's a nice idea, but not enough, yeah, says Tuck's current open. mayor. The highway was seen as a road to resources, but the federal liberal decision to halt oil exploration in the neighboring Beaufort Sea has left the community wondering. Once the road is finished, 
where are people going to work? Tourism can't be an alternative, you know, it's, it's just uh, three months a year here. It, it helps, but it's not the answer. And uh, unless uh, you get into mining or something else, it's going to be a very difficult time for people up here. For now, there is still work to be done. While the road snakes across the frozen landscape, it needs one more thick layer of gravel added. The official opening set for mid-November. After that, Tuktoyaktuk's isolation ends. David Common, CBC News, near Tuktoyaktuk. Now, stay tuned for our latest viewpoint. It may change your mind about the middle class. Time though first for the day's business numbers. The TSX fell 62 points. The dollar was down almost four tenths of a cent. In New York, the Dow dropped 113 points. The price of oil fell 24 cents a barrel. My name is Lincoln Anthony Blades. I write about politics, finance, and culture. I want to talk to you about our obsession with the middle class. 
When the government released its latest federal budget a few weeks ago, all anyone seemed to want to talk about was how it would impact the middle class. The conversation trended towards analyzing how policy helps or hurts families trying to stay middle class. But all this chatter ignores a more pressing question, how to make families middle class. The question of how to make people middle class seems to have an easy answer. Tell people to get off their couches and get to work. But it's not that simple. In Canada, some people believe that if you fail to do well or you fail to move up in life, it isn't about policy and governance, it's really an individual problem of laziness, ignorance and irresponsibility. Far too many Canadians have adopted an elitist class ideology and forgotten what made them middle class in the first place. Too many have forgotten that the onset of modern industrialization here in Canada was rife with greed and exploitation allowing for workers to be crammed into unsafe and unsanitary factories, treated like indentured servants with no access to decent housing, public health and education. And too many have forgotten that it was government policies that boosted the working poor into the middle class. Workmen's compensation laws allowed injured workers to claim regular income. The Unemployment Insurance Act of 1940 and the Medical Care Act of 1966 helped prevent people from slipping into poverty and made class mobility a reality. We've forgotten those facts and our amnesia is coming at the wrong time. While our federal finance minister, Bill Morneau, calls the rise in part-time and precarious work job churn and tells us to get used to it, 56% of Canadians are within $200 per month of being unable to pay for their bills and make their debt payments. Let's be clear, helping the working class from being submerged in poverty is a middle class issue. Inequality damages a nation's economic growth, meaning the future of our nation is as bright or as dark as how we treat the least fortunate. So the next time you want to tell the single mom on welfare to stop being lazy and pull herself up by her own bootstraps, remember, her success is our success. And middle class success had less to do with boots and a whole hell of a lot more to do with policy. For The National, I'm Lincoln Anthony Blades. Monday, October 19th, the slide that didn't stop. Stock markets around the world go into a tailspin. It's Black Monday. There's never been a day like this one on the stock market. Panic selling has shattered records. Fear, pandemonium, and incredible force wreaking havoc in financial markets throughout the world. It's bad, bad. One word, plummet. Panic selling. Panic yeah. selling, that's all it is. Crazy in there. It's really busy. It's really hectic. Jeffrey. Uh, not a good day. By the closing bell on the New York Stock Exchange, the Dow Jones Industrial Average had plunged a record 508 points for a one-day loss of 22.6%, far surpassing the 12.8% drop on October 28, 1929, the day some say heralded in the Great Depression. The Great Crash of 1929. The day the market fell, stocks plummeted in value, paper fortunes wiped out, and much of the world left with a headache that lasted for a full decade. What was it like you were there 40 years ago? Like, well, it was bedlam and madness and, uh, and, and fright and terror and uh, in some cases people committing suicide who had, had several million dollars at one moment and then within a week they had nothing. Could it ever happen again? I suppose everything can happen again. Stock markets around the world went on a wild ride today. 190 points in the morning, then down again, then up again, finally closing up by 102 points, a record one-day gain, which nevertheless recouped only a fifth of yesterday's big losses. They're all coming back now. Even the dogs have a new day. The economic fundamentals in this country remain sound, and our citizens should not panic. Governments today acted swiftly and decisively. They lowered interest rates and they pumped billions of dollars into the financial system. Moves designed to end the fear that the stock market crash will precipitate an economic recession. It's just a crazy market. You can be dead in 20 minutes. We're looking for some more sizable swings, sometimes up, sometimes down for the next few weeks, before it's really clear what the trend will be. Another volatile day on financial markets throughout the world. Prices started plunging in London. 
panic quickly spread as Wall Street opened for business. And it put all other North American stock exchanges into another nosedive. Having a weekend here. One more day to go. Thank God. Lose my voice. As it is. I know that. Oh, wait a minute. Yes. In the U.S. alone, six hundred billion dollars were wiped off the value of stocks in a single week. Investors could only watch in helpless fascination. Even if you lost tens of thousands of dollars, you know you could find something. Yeah, it was fascinating. The way sometimes a bloodbath is fascinating. The musical based in the town of Gander, Newfoundland, during 9-11, has passed a major milestone. Come From Away has joined Broadway's Million Dollar Club after taking in more than $1 million in ticket sales last week. That puts the show in the same company as Wicked, Hamilton, and The Lion King. Come From Away is expected to snag Tony Award nominations when they're announced next month. A production on another part of Canadian history makes its debut this week. An opera about Louis Riel is getting a second life. Directors have made updates to the version performed 50 years ago. But some say they haven't gone far enough with the casting. Deanna Sumanak Johnson explains. More than 130 years after his death, an opera based on Louis Riel's life is stirring up strong emotions. And not just through those dramatic notes. The new staging by the Canadian Opera Company seeks to add more historical sensitivity to the original opera about Riel, which was commissioned for the 1967 centennial. The opera was written in its time, and it's very much an artifact of its time. I'm trying to include a more indigenous frame to how we see it. The new production is performed in four languages, including Michif and Cree. There is a silent chorus of indigenous performers to signify their exclusion from the political dialogue of the day. Still, there are no indigenous singers in the lead roles. Russell Braun, who plays Riel, is a German-Canadian. As a performer, I constantly play cultural, culturally diverse people who I'm not. Young indigenous opera singer Joanna Burt plays the smaller part of Riel's sister Sarah. Opera is not something we as indigenous people strive to do. There's not many of us. As long as the truth is being told, then it doesn't really matter who's playing the role. I love it at the end, Russell. But some it's feel really that the beautiful. casting of Riel just proves why projects like about Indigenous people Michelle need to be Indigenous-led. That uh, rationale of trying to say, you know, that there aren't the performers out there or that there aren't people that can, that can um, uh, perform at the caliber of, of, you know, the National Arts Centre, it's just we know that to not be true anymore. With his Métis singer Jani Lausanne, who performs the newly added role of the narrator, says the opera isn't perfect, but it's an important stepping stone. I'm hoping that, if anything, it offers, it offers the audience an opportunity to go, I want to go back and, and relearn the history I thought I knew. A history of the short but impactful life of an early fighter for Indigenous rights, whose emotion and drama are definitely opera-worthy. Deanna Sumanak-Johnson, CBC News, Toronto. A small group of physics students from Edmonton made scientific history today. Their homemade mini-satellite blasted off from NASA's Cape Canaveral, hitching a ride on a rocket resupplying the International Space Station. Dubbed Exalta-1, it's no bigger than a bread box. But it is the first Alberta-made satellite. It'll whip around the planet at an altitude of 400 kilometers, recording weather data. It should be up there for about two years. And a large asteroid will be visible with a telescope as it buzzes the Earth tomorrow night. Passing at least at less than two million kilometers, quite close in astral terms. If somehow it did hit us, it could be catastrophic, though scientists say it won't. We also dug around and learned that NASA has an asteroid redirect mission, but it's still being planned. 
So for now, in terms of planetary defense, this is about the best we can do. Right. That's The National this Tuesday night. For news at any hour, you can always go to our website, cbcnews.ca. I'm Peter Mansbridge. Thanks for watching.